4 this evening. 2 Timothy chapter 4. The title for the message tonight is How to Prepare a Message. It's a little different than uh, I enjoyed preparing it. The more I've thought about it, the, uh, there's a whole lot more I, we could present. This is basically a, sometimes a course at Bible College that uh, lasts a semester or two. Second Timothy chapter 4, let me read just the first four verses. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. we we'll just stop reading there. As you think about the, all the messages we hear, God has asked us to take the gospel to people. Now, that's a, a big responsibility. And in this passage, he uses the term, preach the word. In, uh, in preparing this sermon, I looked up everywhere in the Bible, it uses the word preach. Now, that's easy nowadays. You put it into your computer and it, it tells you everyone. Um, this is a topical sermon. Uh, there's two basic kinds, there's more than that, but uh, uh, topical sermons where you pick a talk topic, grace, the blood of Christ, and you find out everything the Bible says about it, and then you have to limit uh, how much you can present in uh, however much time you have. And you, you look for God's patterns. You know, you, if you just read all the verses about it, then you begin to see, oh, God says this quite a bit. He says this. Uh, he says this negative, this positive. And uh, you, you prepare uh, to speak about it. I rely heavily on notes. Uh, I learned that from my, my pastor. I've, I always put my sermons like this. I know that when I'm done, it's going to be about half an hour. <laughs> uh, depends on if I, you know, sometimes it goes quicker, sometimes it goes longer. But uh, a topical sermon is where you pick a topic and you find out what God says and you present at least a part of that, usually with an introduction uh, a main point, it's sometimes people call that a proposition. Uh, it's the main thing you're trying to get across. Uh, you have sub-points, you have illustrations. Uh, a lot of times you give a summary and applications. Uh, but you're, you're presenting God's Word. Uh, another type of sermon is expository. Uh, you're familiar with that. Uh, we often do that here where you take a passage of Scripture, a, a few verses to a chapter, uh, sometimes even more, and, and you present that passage. And uh, when you're doing that, you, you study it until you can see, well, what is God saying here? What's the pattern of these verses? Sometimes you just pull out a few things from the verses because, I mean, you could talk about every word for a long time sometimes. But the key to any preaching is, what is God saying? He, he warns us there to be careful about fables. It's, it's all right to use stories in, in your message, but you don't want people to believe stories. You want people to believe the word. And uh, we need to be careful. So, uh, to, to be able to share a message with folks. Now, not everybody's going to stand in front of a church and, and preach like this tonight. But we all get opportunities to talk to people. And uh, we can apply it to both of those. Uh, that's why I felt comfortable uh, bringing this, this message. If we're going to talk to people about what God is saying, number one, you need to spend time with God so you know what God is saying. Uh, Mark, I'm going to look at several verses in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 3 and, and verse 14. This, this is really the essence of discipleship. Um, I have a discipleship course that I've, I've used, and they use this as the core verse of what discipleship is, what it is to follow the Lord. Mark 3, 14 says, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. That's basic discipleship. That we spend time with Jesus, and then we go and serve Jesus. We go and do what, what he's told us to do. Uh, you preach what you learn. Uh, every Christian should have something to share with others. Uh, it's not just preachers. You know, it's not just pastors or uh, evangelists who, who should have a message. Every Christian should have something that they've learned just by being with Jesus. 
You know, if nothing else, you can say, well, you know, when I was walking with Jesus, he, he did it this way. He said this, <laughs> you know. Uh, he's like the, the wonderful big brother that you can cite at every occasion. Uh, spend time with God. Secondly, you can tell people what Jesus has done for you. Uh, look at Mark chapter 5 and verse 18. If you're there in Mark 3, it's pretty easy. Mark 5 and verse 18 is, this is the account of when Jesus cast the demons out of this man. His life had just been awful. Hard to imagine, you know, cutting himself, living in the graveyard, and people trying to, to bind him so that he wouldn't hurt them and so on. And, well, Jesus comes along and, and casts the demons out and changes his life forever. Well, in uh, Mark 5, verse 18, um, when he, that's Jesus, was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. Now, he'd spent some time with Jesus, obviously, because Jesus had healed him and helped him. And now he says, now go and just tell people what, what happened. And, you know, that's, that's what a testimony is. And we just tell what, what's happened. And I think the problem many times is we forget how much God has done for us. We get so used to how wonderful he is that we just kind of accept it, you know. Uh, it's like driving a car. You know, if all of a sudden all the cars in the world were gone, we'd, we'd have to hoof it. You know? Horses, well, well, they'd be popular. You know? uh, but because God is so wonderful, we sometimes forget how wonderful he is. Uh, the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 23 that we preach Christ. You know, that's our message. Uh, this pulpit has a little plaque on it that says, Sir, we would see Jesus. That's just to remind me and, and people who are preaching here uh, it's not us they come to see, <laughs> it's Jesus. And if we're going to have a message, uh, we need to see what, what God has done for us. In 1 Corinthians 1, let me read several of the verses around that. Uh, verse 21, he says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know, as you witness, as you talk to people about the Lord, some will say, oh, that's foolish. Some will say, oh, I can't. But when somebody receives the Lord, they'll, they'll thank you. They'll say, yes. And, uh, you know, what a blessing it is that... Uh, we preach Christ. We preach, and he says, not just Christ, Christ crucified. In that passage there of 1 Corinthians, one of the basic things he's showing is don't marginalize the cross. Now, do you know what I mean by that? Don't push it out to the edge. Keep it in the middle, the cross. Um, we preach Christ crucified. So if we're going to know what to say, we need to spend time with God. We need to publish what he has done. Now, uh, he used a, a word there. Uh, I don't, did I read all the verses? I didn't. I didn't read verse 20 of uh, Mark 5. He, he told him, go tell him. And it says, the man, he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Now, if you look up the word preach in the New Testament, one of the words that will come up is that one, publish. Same word in the Greek. Uh, he was preaching. He was just telling people, man, this is what Jesus did for me. You remember me? <laughs> he can go up to a lot of people and say, remember me? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, we do. Uh, don't hurt me. Uh, and then they could see how God had changed him. And he could tell them what had happened. And you know, He could probably tell them things that Jesus had said and, and so on. So uh, we need to spend time with God. We need to see what God has done for us and share that with people. We read there in 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Just, just preach the word. You know, the, the word of God is, is what people need to hear. They don't need to hear stories. Now, it's not that it's wrong to use an illustration and have a story and, and so on. But that's not the main thing. There, there's a lot of groups now where the, the main thing for when they get together as a church is entertainment. I don't know how. You know, I was saying to my wife the other day, what do these churches preach? They don't preach the Bible. <laughs> 
<laughs> how can you come up with enough to say uh, with the Bible? You'll, you'll never get through it all. But uh, you know, how do you come up with topics when you don't don't believe the, the Bible is God's word? Um, tur turn there to Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. God wants us to preach the word. Second Timothy two verse fourteen. He says, and he's uh, the, the things he's been saying to them. He says, of these things, put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now he's saying, don't preach empty words. The, the Jews... I don't know how far it goes back, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but they have a process they call pill-pull. Pill-pull. It's just extreme argumentation. It's just arguing about every little thing, and, you know, like how many angels can sit on the head of a pin, kind of, you know, really important arguments. Uh, hair splitting. They have a name for it, and it's kind of like a game to them. God doesn't want us to make words of no effect. He doesn't want us just to play with words. Words have real meanings. We were talking about it this morning, uh, how, you know, awesome, that has a meaning. You know, absolutely, that has a meaning. Well, the world has kind of rubbished those meanings and, and make them mean nothing. God's word means something. The words mean something. And they're not just to be used uh, in an empty way. Sometimes we can major on the minor. You know, we can take a, a, a big point. Uh, what's the illustration Jesus gave about the, the camel? And what was the other one? Yeah, and a gnat, you know. Uh, sometimes we get so excited about the gnat, we forget about the, you know, the camel. Uh, I guess I'm using that illustration wrong. But, uh, sometimes we preach things we can't verify from Scripture. You know, it's not right as that when we're preaching the Word to just raise a question. We want to bring answers. You can, you can preach all kinds of, uh, of obscure verses and say, and what, maybe? Well, we don't need the maybe. We need the thus saith the Lord. You know, that's what he's saying here is don't, don't mess around with, with the words of God. Uh, not, not striving about words to no profit, to the subverting of the hearers. You know, turning them away from where they need to be going. Um, the word he uses there, I mean, it's a, it's a nasty word, study. Oh, that's no good. Uh, it is. <laughs> study. He says it takes study. You, you know, you're not going to just look at it and, oh, you know, I've got it. That's it. <laughs> No, you, you might have to read it a few times. You might have to think about it. You might have to, oh, what does that word mean? And uh, you might have to talk to somebody or, you know, and it takes some study to understand the, the word of God. This is the word of God, folks. Uh, this is not little children's books or, you know, Jack went up a hill, you, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, these are the, are, are the words of life. Uh, presenting a message isn't just standing in front of people. The main part of a message is the preparation. Uh, some of you who work with your hands, you know, if you're doing tiling or you know, most jobs, a, a lot of the work is the preparing, painting. It's not just slapping it on the wall. You prepare. Well, it's the same with the message. You prepare. And the Holy Spirit can bless you in, the, in your study just as much as he can bless you in the pulpit. And if you'll let the Lord bless you in your study, he will bless you in the pulpit. I preach long enough now that when I'm up here, this is the fun time. Now, all the work is behind me now. You know, it's, it's all, it's either going to preach or it's not going to preach. You know, and no turning back. Uh, the work is done in the study. And the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart in the study. Now, I have blessings you don't have. My job is to study. Boy, you told me that when I was about 16. I, I'd have turned the other way and run, you know. Uh, but I, I get to do what a lot of Christians would just love to do. Spend some hours in God's Word. Say, well, Lord, what are you saying? What, what do you want our people to hear? Now, you can take some time. You may not have as much time as me. But you can spend time with God. You can see what God has done for you. Uh, you, can, you can read and study and memorize and think about the Word of God. Uh, know what words mean. You know, it's, if you've been a Christian for very long, there's no excuse for you not knowing where the books of the Bible are. And there's no excuse not knowing what some of these basic words are. 
One of the things I do, if, if there's a word that I find hard, I look it up, and then I make a note in my Bible. You know, I might put an arrow, and that means, you know, whatever. Uh, your Bible, don't let your, don't let your Bible outlast you. <laughs> Use it. Use it up. Uh, know what words mean. In uh, Matthew chapter 9 and uh, verse 13, Jesus rebukes some people, religious people, They'd rebuked him for eating with sinners, they called it. He says, go ye and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He's quoting scripture. He said, you need to understand what that means. For I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They didn't understand a real basic thing of, of life. In um, Matthew 12, verse 6, similar kind of a thing. I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. They say, we need to understand what God's words mean. You know, they're, they're not just... I was talking to somebody one time, and, and we'd been talking for a while, and I was about ready to leave, and he said, shall we say in our Father... What? I thought he was saying, arf, arf, arf. I didn't know what he was saying. He was saying, shall we quote the Lord's Prayer together? And our Father. Folks, God's words are not just words that we rattle off with no meaning. They have meanings. And, and as we read it, I know there will be things we'll read past and you won't understand everything every time. But there needs to be times when we stop and say, well, what does that word mean? You know, if you can't say it, you probably don't know what it means. You know? Look it up. Uh, nowadays, with computers, it, it's easy. Uh, I use a, a program called Blue Letter Bible. Man, it's, it's easy. Uh, study. Uh, in um, 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about Paul. Interesting. You, you could say, as Paul said in the book of Peter. <laughs> um, 2 Peter chapter 3, we need to be careful that we're not guilty of distorting the Bible. There's plenty of people who do that, by the way. I've heard people basically explain that black is white, and, you know, I'm talking scriptural concepts. Take something that obviously means one thing and explain it to mean something else. Uh, listen, we don't want to do that. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, the end of verse 15, uh, he talks about how Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. W-R-E-S-T, that means they distort. I've got that written off to the side there. <laughs> As they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Listen, we don't want to be people who distort the scripture. And, and I'm not saying anything. We're not all going to be Bible scholars and that kind of thing. But at least we don't want to distort it. We don't want to try and wrestle it to mean what we want it to mean. Now, study. That means... Know the Bible. You know, know, know the Lord. In uh, Matthew 22 and verse 29, there's another situation that comes up. They, they had come to Jesus. They presented a situation to him. This man marries a woman, and he dies, and so his brother has to marry her. Well, the, the law was you had to you know, do that. So they keep, the brothers keep dying until all seven brothers have married her, and then he dies, and she dies, and... And their question is, who's, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? This is their, you know how some people have this killer question they're going to ask you. Uh, well, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Now that's important. We need to know the scriptures, and we need to know the Lord. Uh, there's just some things that, as you get to know God's word, you'll know, that's not the way God is. Other things, you'll, yeah, that's, that's, that's the Lord. And you need to know uh, God's Word. Uh, they, they were sharing things uh, that, you know, their, their situation had nothing to do with the reality of, of God's Word. Uh, we need to preach the Word. Now, let me give you a, an example this evening in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter preaches a sermon. It's a pretty short sermon. Although it does say, 
at the end um, with many other words did he testify and exhort. So we're not sure how long it was. But uh, what did I say? Acts chapter 2. Quite often when you're bringing a message, it will have an introduction. It'll have a body, you know, the main thing you're going to say. Then it has a conclusion. Uh, in, in the body and in, in, the, in the main part of the message, often you'll have illustrations. And you might have a story that relates to it and, and so on. And Peter starts his sermon with an introduction. Now his introduction is probably a little different because he's coming from an event uh, that people have been quite uh, amazed by. You know, it's the day of Pentecost. Fire has, has come on, on them. Uh, they've, they've, sp- they've been speaking the words of God in different languages. People have been, oh, you know, oh, he's talking my language, you know, and, and all different languages. And, and Peter's coming from that, and he's going to bring them to Christ. So in the introduction, uh, he, he brings them from the situation to thinking about what, is, what does all this have to do with, with Jesus? And one of the things that uh, you'll see as he does this is he knew he, who he was talking to. If you're going to bring a message, know your audience. <laughs> uh, he's talking to Jewish people. So he uses Jewish illustrations. He uses this, the Old Testament and, and so on. You know, if you're talking to, uh, like you'll see some of the testimonies of Paul in the book of Acts. Sometimes he's talking to Jewish people. He talks appropriately. Sometimes he's talking to Gentiles. Maybe the king or, you know, someone who's not Jewish. He uses words that they understand. He uses illustrations that will relate to them. I've said to people, I've used the word to non-Christian people, Scripture. I was looking in the Scripture. Scripture? Oh, what's that? (laughs) Yeah, for people to understand you, you have to use words they understand. If you're talking to children, you talk differently than if you're talking to mature Christians and and so on. Anyway, uh, Peter knew his audience, and he used words and phrases they understood. Let let me start reading there in verse 14. We'll basically just read through his sermon. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. Now, there's a a point. Make sure if you're going to give a message, make sure people can hear you. Can can I just add, if you're praying with other people, I, I know you're not praying to them, but to pray together, we do need to hear each other. That's just a footnote. All right. Lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That would catch your attention. Especially if you're aware of Joel, man, he's he's getting pretty exciting as he's going along there. And he's bringing it, uh, taking them from Pentecost to Christ. Uh, he, he's, the intro is establishing God told us this would happen, and here's what it has to do with. All right? Uh, so then he gets to his explanation. He has basically five points uh, that he makes. Uh, in, in verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Just in a nutshell, he's saying the real Messiah couldn't remain dead. (coughs) He's already starting to bring to bring it home to them. He's not making this general. He's saying, uh, you, you've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But, but his main point there is, the real Messiah is not going to stay dead. His next point is, Psalm 16 told us this. Let me read, verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, 
for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, he makes it personal, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now you can see, these are things that you and I may not understand as much as those people there would have, because they were Jewish people who, who understood more of the Old Testament probably than most of us do. But he's saying, Psalm 16 told us this. And he's using someone they really admire, David. Well, they honor David. David told us this. The prophet David, he's seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ. So he's relating that to point one. The, the real Messiah is not going to remain dead. Psalm 16 tells us this. The third point is, we've witnessed this. Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. There's an interesting thing about the resurrection and the gospel. The closer people were in time and space to the gospel, the more of them received it. You know, the people who lived in Jerusalem, when Peter gets down here, lots of people get saved. Because they, they either had seen or knew somebody who had seen these exact things happen. It wasn't just... You know, we talk to the kids in Sunday school, and we have to we point on a map to this little yellow dot, you know. It happened there. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it happened a long time ago, you know. Well, they could say, well, it happened last week or, you know, 40 days ago. And now uh, it, it happened, you know, my, my aunt saw it. You know, she, she experienced it. We saw it. Uh, so his, his third point is, we've witnessed this. And then he brings it to what happened today is also proof. Verse 33, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. So he's relating uh, the scriptures. He's relating what they've seen. He's relating what happened at Pentecost. And he's showing them, this is the Christ that Joel was talking about. This is the Christ, the Messiah, that the Old Testament has been telling us would come. And then... Um, the last point, basically, is Psalm 110 uh, promised his exaltation. Uh, verse uh, 34, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Uh, so again, he's relating it back to that, uh, the real Messiah is not going to remain dead. God said he's going to reign. So, he makes an application now. Verse 36, therefore, there's the therefore. Every sermon needs a therefore. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He makes it personal. You crucified him. He's the Lord. He's the Christ. Look at their response. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So he makes a second application and basically an invitation in verse 38. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And there's the invitation. It's a crooked generation you're living in. That's what the word untoward means. Again, I've got that written in my Bible. It's not a word I use very often unless I'm reading Acts chapter 2. Um, he makes the application. He makes it personal. You know, when, when we're just talking to an individual, it's no good talking to them about everything in general. We've got to talk to them about things specifically. And we need to use specific verses. Uh, people don't just need to hear our arguments. People need to meet our Lord. And uh, you know, if we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one message, we'll share the Lord with them. Do it kindly. Do it carefully. 
uh, but share the Lord with them. If you're sharing a message, you, you know, to a small group or a big group, uh, you, you know, don't just talk so general that nobody can get anything out of it. Make it, make it personal. Make it, make it practical. Um, you know, he, he says to them, you've committed a great crime. You've rejected and crucified your Christ. Oh, what should we do? And then he explains to them. And uh, their response in verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Uh, they had a godly response. You know, if you read other places, you'd have to understand they, they repented of their sin and, and trusted in the Lord. And it wasn't just something they did for that day. It changed their lives. They began to fellowship with other believers and to, and to serve. Now, we're not all going to be a Peter. And in thinking about this, I don't know that Peter prepared this ahead of time. Maybe he did. Maybe he'd but probably not. Uh, the Lord just helped him as he preached. But we're, we're not all going to be a Peter. We, uh, we probably won't preach to 3,000 people, let alone have 3,000 people get saved at once. Uh, but God tells us all to preach the gospel. That's man, woman, and child. That's not just preachers. I'm not just talking about giving a message from the pulpit. Uh, he says, it, like we read in Timothy, preach the word. And I can guarantee you, if you'll walk with Jesus, you'll have something to say. It's probably not going to be earth-shattering. But that's not what people need. People just need to, to know from someone who has an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. You know, it's, it's just very simple. In John chapter 9, I was thinking about this this week. The man who was born blind, you remember him? And, and Jesus, Jesus healed him. And then they... The, the religious leaders began to question his parents. Who is this? That, you know, who's doing this? Talk to our son. He's an adult. You know, they put him off. So they go to the, the man who'd been born blind and now could see. And said, you know, let, me, let me read some of the, some of the verses here. Um, they say to him, the man that's born blind, verse 24, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. You're talking about Jesus. Well, he basically said to them, listen, I, I don't know much about him, but I know this. I was blind. Now I see. Listen, there's just some things people can't argue with that the Lord has done for us. And, and, and I can guarantee you, that man wasn't about to have people criticize Jesus. He, he didn't even know who he was at that point. When Jesus came back later, and he asked him, do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, Lord? Jesus said, it's me. I believe. He said, <laughs> uh, but he wasn't about to let somebody criticize the one who just given him his sight. Uh, God had done something for him. The, the, the other fellow who was set free of, of demons in uh, uh, Luke chapter 8, yeah, he went and he published, he preached the, uh, the word. I doubt if he would have taken a whole lot of criticism of the Lord either. And you know, a message sometimes will be unplanned and informal. Um, you know, Philip and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. He comes upon this man reading the Bible. He asks him, do you understand what you're reading? Yeah. The guy says, oh, no, how do you understand it? And the Bible says, Philip opened his mouth and preached Jesus. <laughs> he explained to him how that related to Jesus. Uh, sometimes a, a message will be planned. It, it'll be a, a sermon. You know, we've studied to show ourselves approved unto God, and we've, we've asked God to, to give us a message. But either way, let me close with, with four things here. Uh, be prepared. Uh, God may never ask you to, uh, to stand in front of, of our church and, and preach a message, but every one of us is to have a message. Uh, in 1 Peter 3.15, he says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And we can change those words and show you what, what he's saying. He doesn't say be ready most of the time. <laughs> be ready Sunday morning at 10.30. <laughs> now he says be ready always to give an answer. We just need to be prepared. 
I would encourage you, look for opportunities. Look for the Holy Spirit working. Now, be careful. We don't want to Bible bash people. We're not trying to beat people into submission. But if we share some scriptures and, and they, there seems to be the Lord working in their hearts, continue on. If he's not, stop. You know, don't, don't what's the old saying? Don't beat a dead horse. Uh, but be prepared. Be prepared. Secondly, do it for the glory of God. Uh, God says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, third and fourth, <laughs> if you're anywhere near it, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. I, I found this, a, 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 this verse an encouragement to me personally. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 11. He tells us two things. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Do you understand those words? Oral, do you know oral? When you speak, you need to speak as the mouth of God. Now, I don't mean that in a weird way. But what you need to do is share what God would have you to share. Share what... Uh, I remember a guy saying, uh, try sometime when you finish your prayer, say, and Lord, I'm praying this because I believe this is what Jesus would pray. He said, that'll, that'll change your attitude toward prayer. And in our speech, our words to others, we need to stop and think, is this what Jesus would say? That's what God is saying here. Let him speak as the oracles of God. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm a very important or very uh, magnificent person in any way. But listen, I have a magnificent God. And, and I can speak with confidence because I can say, thus saith the Lord. And I expect you to strain out the, the Bramlettisms. But I don't want you to strain out the, the God things. You hear what I'm saying? That, that verse helped me. And I think it'll help you if you'll realize, listen, when we share God's word with people, we're just being God's mouth. And that's a good thing. The second thing he says, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. God doesn't expect more from you than he's given you. If you can't physically use your mouth, you know, there's people like that. God doesn't expect you to use your mouth. <laughs> you know? If, if you... There, there's some people who are really good at talking. Let me say, there's a danger in that because you, don't, you might not always rely on the Lord. You just put it into gear and let her go, you know. Uh, but he says, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. And here's the reason, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Now speak as God's mouth and do it to the best of your ability. Now, I've asked some of the men in the rest of the year to a few Sunday nights are going to be bringing messages. This will not prepare you for everything you need to know. Uh, if you have other questions about that, feel free to, to talk to me. But the key thing, I think, for all of us is, are we walking with Jesus? If we're walking with Jesus, we'll have things we'll be able to share. Are you talking about Jesus to others? Let me just woke up. Are you talking about Jesus to, to others? Um, we, the reason we sang that song tonight, make my life to be like a melody, ever sounding out the message of the cross. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Why don't we close with that? Do you still have that, that music? Uh, Brother Neville, you come. I guess I led it, didn't I? So I'll, I'll do it again. <laughs>